first poem I shall read is called Orangerie and indicates the profound feeling I have that um, Darwinism isn't quite enough to explain all that sometimes it's asked to explain. Sprays of white blossom open from buds on my orange bush with small green fruit crowding the same branches while four whole oranges gleam ready and ripe bending their stems to earth waiting the fall the simultaneity of birth growth and death looking more closely I saw a tiny ant on a twig, rubbing its feelers together and muttering, natural selection, natural selection. <laughs> and then I read in the Scientific American of that myrmecophile beetle, Atomiles pubicollis, spending his summers being fed by formica ants who adopt him because he secretes a juice irresistible to ants. And how, leaving these hosts when winter comes, he moves out to the grasslands to find Myrmica ants. There, repeating the process of succulent secretion, so he will be dragged to another brood chamber, where he will be fed for another six months. And sure enough, watching the migration, I saw a confident beetle trundling along, murmuring, survival of the fittest, survival <laughs> of the fittest. <laughs> and here's a poem about that unpopular thing called the law. This is the law. Who says go when the green says go? And who says no when the red says no, asked I. I, said the law. I say go when the green says go, and don't you go when the red says no, said the law. Who are you to tell me so, to tell me go when the green says go, and tell me no when the red says no, asked I. I am you, said the law. Are you me, as I want to be? I don't even know who you are. I speak for you, said the law. You speak for me. Who told you you could? Who told you you should? How can this thing be when I'm not the same as before? I was made for you. I was made by you. I am human too. So change me if you will. Change the green to red. <coughs> Shoot the ruling class, stand me on my head, but I will not be dead. I'll be telling you go, I'll be telling you no, for this is the law, said the law. And I'll now give you one extract from a, a treaty with the Indians, which the Indians had photographed from the original manuscript of the treaty, blown up largely, and had on the wall of one of their rooms in the pavilion. And the treaty was written in a beautiful script, longhand, capital letters, punctuation. The treaty was signed by two Indian chiefs, not signed, they made their mark, they were incapable of signing, because they were completely illiterate. And one Indian chief signed with a picture of a snake, and the other Indian signed with a picture of some other animal. And this is what they signed. We, the undersigned chiefs and warriors, on behalf of the people of the Niwash Band of Chippewa Indians, residing at Owen Sound, send greeting. Whereas we and our people, having the fullest confidence in the eternal care and good intentions of our kind father, the Governor General, 
towards all his Indian children, and foreseeing all the benefits that we and our posterity are likely to derive from the surrender of large portions of the reserve in the year of our Lord, 1854, we have, after mature consideration in several full councils held at our village of Newash, arrived at the conclusion that it will be to our advantage to place at the disposal of our father, the Governor General, the land upon which we now reside, commonly known as the Newash or Owen Sound Reserve, in order that he may cause the same to be sold for our benefit. 40,000 acres of the best southern Ontario land was thus relieved of the presence of the Indian. Dancing. Long ago, when I first danced, I danced holding her back and arm, making her move as I moved. She was best when she was least herself, lost herself. Now I dance, seeing her dance away from me. She looks at me dancing. We are closer, held, not with hands, held in the movement of the dance. I no longer dance with myself. We are two, not one. The dance is one. I'm going to read just one poem, because that's all that I'm in the mood for tonight. It's called In Praise of Old Women. Not older women, written by that by now brash middle-aged Hungarian, but for <laughs> old women. Kind with wrinkles. <clears throat> it's a reply to a bitterly, acidly cynical Polish poet, Tadeusz Rozejewicz, who also wrote a poem about old women. Yes, Tadeusz Rozejewicz, I too prefer old women. They bend over graves with flowers. They wash the limbs of the dead. They count the beads of their rosaries. They commit no murders. They give advice or tell fortunes. They endure. In Poland, in Russia, in Asia, in the Balkans, I see them, shawled, kerchiefed, bent back, work wrinkled. But today is, have you been to America where we have no old women, no stara babas, Everyone today is sung in America, especially the women, with coif blue hair which gleams like the steel of jets in the daytime sky. <laughs> Smooth-skinned at 60, second abuse at 50, renaissance, they never grow old in America. And we have in America literate, sexually liberated women who wouldn't touch a corpse, who confuse lechery with love, not out of viciousness, poor dears, but boringly out of confusion, neuroses, identity crises. Today, as I go to the cemetery with my mother, one of us stoically old, the other aging. And I tell you, today, as I will grow old in America. I will have no second debut. I will raise my son on old battles, Kosovo, Naretva, Thermopylae, Stalingrad, and Britain, and I will wrinkle adamantly in America. I will put salt in the soup, and I will offer bread and wine to my friends, and I will stubbornly praise old women until their thin, taut skins glow like icons ascending on escalators, like Buddhas descending in subways. And I will liberate all women to be old in America because the highest manifestation of wisdom, Hagia Sophia, is old and a woman. Thank you.
I want to read tonight a series of poems. They're among the most recent of my poems, and uh, they're very personal. I'm not sure whether they're completely finished yet, but they are the ones which are at the moment uh, most important to me. Uh, there are a series of elegies for my father, Arthur Cross Scobie, who died on July 28th of this year. Elegies are for those who survive. They give us some words to speak, some sounds to hear in this new silence. Here I am at 28 years old, untouched by death. And a voice tells me, your father is dead. Then, for a long, long time, there was nothing I could say. Nothing at all. Two days before he died, my father stood on a height of land beside a cairn of stones, the fields far distant beyond him. This is the last photograph ever taken of my father. Beside the cairn, he is an element in the picture's composition, giving it measure, a sense of scale. The stones are taller than he is. In the middle of landscape, now there is absence. All measures are disrupted. He is returned to elements deeper than stone. And for us who remain, who can hold in our hands this thin and paper image, there is only the learning of how to talk about absence, of how to speak those unspeakable phrases to say, Father, Father, two days before you died. I'm driving home over the hill from St. Andrews. To the west is Kelly Law, and to the south, from Berwick Law to the Isle of May, the fourth is opening to the sea. On the back seat of the car, Beside my brother is the small oak casket of ashes. Oh, Father, I never thought to drive you home like this. Sixteen letters. With a quick professional eye, the stonemason counts the first phrase as a unit, pausing to count each letter only when he comes to the name. It is all so easy then, so quickly summed up, these 16 letters in loving memory of. Father, your final country now. These summer fields, gold in the days before harvest, and stretching gently to the sea, from here, the center, the church on the hill. The sun shines, this is not a day when any stone could be cold. Neither of the ancient walls of Carnby Church, nor the new granite of my father's grave. We carve on the stone a few simple words, and we set it here in the center Father, no wind has yet prevailed against you. Love, we hold against this death, all separation hold. This love we know is all we have. We have to hold against all death, this separation. Father, I let you go now. Father, I let you pass. Into silence, memories, photographs, all that I scarcely know or comprehend. 
Father, I let you go now. Father, I let you pass. Grief, I let you go now. Grief, I let you pass. And to all the words I wanted to speak, now never will. And to all the tears I cried one afternoon, and will not again. Into the life that goes on in spite of things. Grief, I let you go now. Father, I let you pass. It's an ugly poem. It contains a history of the human race. It takes its title from half of the first line, The Grandeur Was When. The grandeur was when men adapted to nature, sophisticated grunts, and there was the wheel, fire, his woman big-bellied while he fought the mastodon, got the better of whatever it was, roof against rain, shod in leather, then against brust thumping conquered himself, a script of some humor. Yet love got in and love of where he was, and therefore science, pairing redundancies, errors, moons, a millionth of an inch by laser beam, the pairing done, knowledge from mystery, poetry from fact as hide from bearer to be cured, problem from protein, trouble from sickness. The pairing done, he threw away beer cans, safes, old cars, containers, plastic, exhaust from pipes, tin foil, cellophane, urine, spit, papers, Wrappers from products, chewing gum, wads, excrement, damned nature beaten. And this is a poem about love. It's called The Charge of the Light Brigade. <laughs> the charge was up a hill outside of Barcelona in Spain uh, on our way to uh, trying to find the model old city. And the light brigade was my wife, uh, me in front and my wife behind with the tote on her back in good Spanish fashion. <laughs> Charge the light brigade. Thistles and lizards, that's what I got her into. Because of stubbornness about knowing the way when I didn't. Like Hannibal who lost 50 elephants choosing a wrong alp. Boney and Moscow. Sticking your neck out, Charles on his royal block, is your own divine right. <laughs> it's your own head. In my instance, alas, she was totally trusting, sweetly following with the tote on her back wherever my great pig-headedness led her, knowing it all. Mountains look flat on a map. Get yourself into lizards and thistles, but not your love. Thank you. The first one is about nationalism, and it appeared in that famous Canadian periodical, Prism International. Hello, is that you? This is me. Day after day, night after night, having this conversation with God, long distance, asking him, God, did I teal other Hun, Voltaire, Nietzsche, Abelard, and other guys on my list finally make immigrant status? <laughs> asking him about bad popes, Women Popes, Errol Flynn, and if there's a football team up there, and a first 11. Asking him, when there's another war in heaven, what's your policy, G? 
on draft card burners. What would you say if Earthmen captured one of your chariots for trespassing inside our 12 mile limit? <laughs> Questions of moment asking him. His answers are muffled, voice like chewed fog. But sometimes his favorite question comes through loud and clear. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? What bothers me? Who'll pay for the call when I finally hang up? <laughs> or will he cut me off, his dead receiver, leaving me no one to talk to? Another bill stacked up to meet on the due date. <laughs> when the bailiff comes, I won't be home. Only dangling by its cord, my cherry red telephone, wailing and sputtering, born without gods, without an answer. The white dove flew from the dark field of night, like breathing. Even in that, something to learn, how to go deeper. Or swimming, an instinct billion years in the blood, but brought from the dark again to the surface. Or diving, go in too deep, you may have visions, never recover, or the bends, despondency, madness. Good to imagine it, poem as breathing, the simple act of being, yet made of words through which no clarity is lost. Once or twice, the simple miracle may occur, Otherwise, it's like unfolding the layered petals of a flower or the small thing remaking another poet, tenth pressing of the grape, as now when a line so given will not leave me, plunging deeper far than its occasion, the white dove flew from the dark field of night. What is being given me? Who is the giver? Is there more I am missing? Perhaps the more shines too brilliant for me to see. The white dove flew from the dark field of night, like an echo through the poem of my life, intimations from the dark field of night, of Kairos, the white dove, the one poem. Thank you. A Backwards Journey. When I was a child of, say, seven, I still had serious attention to give to everyday objects. The Dutch cleanser, which was the kind my mother bought, in those days came in a round container of yellow cardboard around which ran the very busy Dutch cleanser woman, her face hidden behind her bonnet, holding a yellow Dutch cleanser can, on which a smaller Dutch cleanser woman <laughs> was holding a smaller Dutch cleanser can, on which a minute Dutch cleanser woman held an imagined Dutch cleanser can. This was no game. The woman led me backwards through the eye of the mind until she was the smallest point my thought could hold to. And at that moment, I think I knew that if no one called and nothing broke the delicate jet of my attention, that tiny image could smash the atom of space and time. The other poem is called Stefan. Stefan, aged 11, looked at the baby and said, when he thinks, it must be pure thought because he hasn't any words yet. And we, proud parents, admiring friends who had looked at the baby, looked at the baby again. <laughs> now this poem, um, is called Leviathan <coughs> in a Pool, and it's about three whales in a marina in Victoria. 
They are called Haida and Nootka and Chimo. The poem is in three parts. It's not a very long poem. And the first part of the first part uh, describes one whale. Black and white plastic, inflatable, a child's giant toy, teeth perfectly conical, tongue pink, eyes where ears are, blowhole, fontanelle, a rip in a wet inner tube, third eye, out of which speech, breath, and beautiful fountains flower. So much for linear description, phrases in place of whale. This creature fills that pool as an eye at socket, moves, laughs like an eye, shines like an eye, eye bright, eye shaped, mandorla of meeting worlds, forked tail attached and fin like a funny sail. It is rotund and yet flexible as a whip, lighter than air going up, and heavy as a truckload of bricks. It leaps sky high, it flies, and comes down whack on its freshly painted side. And the spectators get wet, drenched, soaked to the hide. Tongue lolling like a dog's after a fast run. Pleased with itself and you, it seems to want to be petted, rears its great head up, hangs it, its tiny eyes gleam, heading minute as white bait slip down its throat. Dear whale, we say, as if to a child, we beam, and it disappears utterly with so dark a thrust of its muscle through silver tines of water, only streamers of brine, tiny tinsels of brine remain. Swim round the pool vocalizing, the boy says, and toot they call through their blowholes. Toot, toot, toot. At sea, they will sometimes sing for 30 minutes, cadences, recognizable series of notes, songs which carry hundreds of miles, sing together, sing singly. Here in a small pool, they vocalize on command, joyous short toots, calls, why am I crying? Haida and Nootka respond to whistle signals. Each whistle has its own pitch, and each whale knows which is which. Haida and Nootka respond to hand signals. Fresh from the wild Pacific, they answer the hand signals. The words are for us who have not yet learned that two blasts mean give your trainer a big kiss, or a flick of the wrist means vocalize. Chimo white as Moby, albino and still a baby, is deaf and has poor vision, like white cats, white men and women. So Chimo cannot respond to hand or whistle. Yet this high-spirited, lissom, girl of a whale, unexpectedly pale as if still not dressed, performs. She leaps like Nootka, flaps like Haida, vocalizes. What are her cues and signals? In what realm do her lightning actions rise? I lean upon the pool's wet rail. Through eyes, sightless, sideways glances, seem to see a red line on the air, as bright as blood that threads them on one string, trainer and whales. Thank you.
What's so big about green? Things had been going the wrong way for a couple of thousands of millions of years without us being there to prevent it. Then the mountains stopped heaving and even suffered burial, at least on our half of the globe. Burial under ice, four miles high. Lovely, the real peace. But something went really haywire about a hundred centuries ago. A tilt, the cap melted back. There was drip and rot all over again and saltless water blocking the gouges. Up from the stinking seas, the corrupt south slid the fish, and the stubborn grass crept with mice. Life was at it again. The good old lava made a last try to stop it. Boiled up a rash of volcanoes. It was merry hell for a while, but not merry enough. The hydrocarbons came sloshing back, infecting air, soil, lakes, like this one. Lake Opal, they still call it. Something to do with the original color. Better have named it sulfur for the spring on the shore, boiling and fuming and yellowing up from the faithful lava. The one thing that's lasted, pure, defying even the algae, and perfumed with primal chaos. Last generation's poets and ad writers, if one can believe them, saw dawn on the high peaks, like an opal's fire sliding down from a sky that was actually blue. And over the green wounds the trees used to make in the rock flesh, the hotel's PR boys swore they saw jays and daisies, heard squirrels, and smelt mountain heather in the wind guaranteed soul bomb. But it was a phony piece, we all know now. Even before man, uh, the deer at that lake must have come up in a tremble to drink, noses wrinkling at the sulfur. Foreigners with ears taut for the stir of a cougar on a tree limb. At best it was only a balancing off for a few millennia between grouse and wolf, a poise between osprey and salmon, the wrens and the berries, and the first men. For when the Chehalis arrived, inching up the outlet stream in their dugouts following the salmon and sperm, they paddled slap into magic, their first hot spring. Whether it was the chemistry of belief or of the pool, the wounds of their braves healed when splashed and plugged with potash from the banks. So the savages ferried survivors from tribal rows down on the big river up to the Lake of Healing, as they called it. And the unwounded, waiting around for the holy water to work, made doodles with red oxide on the cliffs. You can see photos of them in the old book still. Get well cards they were maybe, or, or just Kilroy was here. Nobody knows, they're all gone now. The Chehalis too, and the salmon with them, that used to block canyons with their rush to mate and die. They went when we came, the whites, the end men, arrived to finish the job. That was only 200 years ago. Explorers like Fraser shedding his name on the big river and christening the canyon Hell's Gate Behind him, the trappers coming through the lake on a bypass and staying to set up a fort by the place of healing. They cut down the pines, shot off the game and the Indians, trapped everything wearing fur and moved on. After 10 years, the fort was absorbed in the new bush. The lake almost won. But by 1858, we're back looking for gold this time. And the lake only a shortcut north. There was time, however, to cut down the rest of the trees, build a steamer and stoke it. The boat swallowed and disgorged, mules, pack horses, even camels, and always men, our men, rushing up to eat the gold and die of it. Our grandfathers, in fact. Ten years and quiet again, but still not the real sort. 
and not for long. Nothing's quiet where there are ears. This raging sun has never been heard. It sees with the others set in the first piece, the one we'll never enjoy. 1886, the first train rumbled through Hell's Gate, and the end was in sight. A railroad really gets a wilderness by the throat, sends its fingers out to rub the green skin off. This one only tickled the lake but it scratched up a fine carcinoma called Vancouver only two hours away. That was our father's generation. They slashed in roads, ran power lines over the balding ridges, sawed the big firs into suburbs, ground the small pines to Sunday supplements, and multiplied that old mephitic stink into the general sulfite wind. They dammed the lake, of course, to feed the power lines, bit out gravel pits, blasted off the stumps, and hammered up a resort town at Opal Lake. It was a progress, but no one dreamed we'd be fast enough to finish it, my generation, but we were. We straddled the old springs with a high riser, the place of healing chalet, complete with cocktail bars, saunas, resident European psychiatrists, and a hell port on the roof. <laughs> Copters came in hourly now, rowing ulcerous burgers from the permanent wars in the continental city. They are dipped in the pool before color TV and sedation while their kids buzz the lake length in an hour of speed, on speed, drag racing around the stumps in the yellow waters. No worry with fishermen now, of course. The last mercuric trout washed belly upwards long ago. And there's nothing that pullulates but algae and whatever bugs live on in oil or shit. No trouble either for the jet planes from birds. The eagles went with the grizzly and the elk down to the zoos in Vancouver. Some say there's a berry patch still at the lake's far end, but then some swear there are Sasquatches, those eight men with giant feet glimpsed first by the Indians on the ridges. Who knows? You can't see ridges anymore. Now that our overcast has linked Vancouver's sky with, to the North American permacloud, the peaks are still there, of course. Glacier hung even over Lake Opal. We know that because the Geiger boys climb up to check the Cascades. They're hotter now than those old sulfur springs, but not with sulfur. Just as well the Cascades don't reach the lake today. Anyway, we're draining it with a new instant and with the new instant cement mix, we can firm the bottom for another supersonic jet port. Some radicals still moan about it, but hell, there's nothing left to look at, except the kind of hell, now that napalm and erosion have cleaned up the last greenery on the shores. What's so big about green? It's made to rot away, like flesh. Green, gangrene. Bear lava's best. It's closer to the sun. That's where life is, real life, fire and atoms being born. What's happened here on Earth? Only a science fiction nightmare, soonest over. Somebody had to get us back in step with all the other moons and planets. That's why I can't help feeling kind of proud. Because where I live, we've done it all in four generations. We've made organic death at last an irreversible reaction and finished the original plan before 1984. <laughs> What's more, we've done it without even a good earthquake to help or even a new volcano and by Jupiter without using a single bomb. Just, just ourselves and our kids. Okay, so one day I found myself falling in love again. And it was a, a peculiar experience because besides falling in love and as a ramification of falling in love, I realized that I was being stripped of all possibility of action. And that for me, falling in love meant that I became passive 
and this poem is about that. It's called Spanish Jewels. You bring with you stories of your life like jewels of Spain to the Grand Queen or dusty bits of sand to the oyster. Expect me to tend them and make them grow opal round in my life. I wonder what shapes they'll force, what tentacles they'll grow. Marxism in the context of this poem means a philosophy which to quite to quote um, Marx on Feuerbach means that you do not just interpret the world, but you try to change it. And that's the ramification of the word in the poem. I can always win him back with Marxism, but he must know he wants me too. Pride swallowed in the rich galled turnings of my throat. I clutch the palpable risings of folded tears and declare she or I, she or I. But first the argument the necessary essay on truth and why chauvinism will destroy us both. You came home. But why the split between passion and thought? Why the skin of must on the skeleton of our need? Why the horror of the leaving, the staleness of the rebirth? Why your needs so different, after all, from mine? I know I can always win him back with Marxism, but he must know why. And this year, I am much lighter in years, children, pain, than I will be. This poem is called Flower Song. Now, when you listen to this poem, you have to remember that the poet in any love thing is at an unfair advantage. That is, that person gets to say how they feel about the relationship, right? The other person doesn't have such a voice. So when you hear this poem, you must remember that. Flower Song. From out here at the end of your arms, that far removed from your center, and having a center of my own, it takes a while to see the folding up of the white narcissus you call love. At first, I thought it a lilac, smelling so garish for joy. Now petal after petal turns brown, moves away in careless death. Do not seek to know your love, you think, as we watch your white narcissus fold to its center. From out here, at arm's length, I see how the petals begin to gorge on each other. This next poem, um, there's a, there's a, a common uh, thing in uh, conventional middle-class society which is a great deal of individual competition. It flourishes among uh, politicians, among poets, among women. Um, it's murderous, and it drives people mad. Um, and this poem is for my friend, who, as a result of that kind of, um, not precisely in humanity, but at least bickering, um, is in fact not yet healed. Listen. These sounds of bones cracking back and again these moans out of night crying bitten bite are us. We ourselves as we splinter then and again walking on long knives. This last poem is called Slag. Um, I lived for a long time in Sudbury which you may or may not know is the place where when they wanted to train astronauts for the moonwalk they sent them to Sudbury to walk on the surface of the earth there. It is a rather amazing uh, place. Slag is um, the refuse that's left. After you've taken everything valuable out of the ore, you have slag left. And it is uh, kind of like a plastic substance, and it's red. And as a child, I used to watch it falling down on this huge slag pile on the outside of town and um, imagine different kinds of things. I mean, kids can be imaginative about anything, right? You got trees, you're imaginative about trees. You got slag, you're imaginative about slag. Um, we had slag. Now, there's, an, there's another thing about it, though, um, which is that to a kid, it can be something that you make pictures out of, see, see gnomes or gremlins. But to the adults who worked in the mill, it was something else. And that's one thing about this poem. The other thing about this poem to consider is that it's um, a response about why people write, what they try to say, what are the things that move them, what it, you know, why, why be a poet. It's called slag. Always word obsessed five and naming out the letters to capture them, S, 
L A G. Look, mummy, how the word falls bumped like the slag heap. I named things to possess them in child magic. Learning slag, my friend's father died when the dump car overturned on him and his flesh burnt one with the slag, and slag became hill, red, thick air, black rocks, dead father, giants in the night, a bumped word, inco, dead father, company town, union, dead father, no grass for long. And slag is why, for what reason? Song five of the sea. Sea song, wave song, sea wave wash, beach song, song of shells of wave wash, blood wash in the ear, the beach of stars, the flesh we sing in, rhythm as to swim in. Blood that sings a life, the sea song, wave song, wash of white foam on the long lean beach of thighs. Song six, even song, even, ever even neen, the even song of light fall, night fall, moon rise, even against the even neen of sky into darker blue, the moon is white, the night, an even hue, and even you are watching, are listening for the song the even neen brings. Song seven, leaves song in the spring, it springs forth, it opens, leaves leaf through the bright air, opening as in a song the air rises as leaf to. And song eight, autumn leaves song of leaf leaves the green behind the blind beggar winter waits with his white stare, leaves nothing there, a Falling air leaves off where it began. A student of mine last year turned to another student in the creative writing course who was writing poems that were always very, very sad. He said this to her, This is happiness, my dear. You eat it with a knife and fork. Michael Penny said that. Only don't chew it too long, it'll lose its flavor. Swallow it now, quickly, it will hit you like brandy on an empty stomach. Wipe out your nervous system, taking over as it moves throughout your whole frame. Happiness is, well, we all know, don't we? No, we don't know happiness. Don't understand it, don't need to, but take it in, swallow, yes or it will melt in your hand like warm chocolate, dribble through your fingers, fall brown, an ugly stain on pure snow. If you eat it fast, it is delicious, and that is all you need to know. This next one is a kind of chant from four songs for their burnt out marriage. Yes, love burns, because it burns, yes, it does. It burns, love, yes, it does, love burns. It burns, it hurts, love hurts too. It does, it burns, because love, it burns. Both ways, love, coming and going, it burns. Re-entry speed, outer space or sun, side of the moon, sun stroke, it burns, love. On one side or another, it burns. Always, love, it burns all ways, burns one way or another, love. You feel it burn, love, it burns. See the rat in the jelly, steaming, dirty hair, frozen. Bring it out on a glass tray, Split the pie four ways and eat. I took great care cooking this treat for you. And though it looks good to you, and though it smells of the Westinghouse still, and tastes of exotic fish or maybe the expensive ass of a cow, I want you to know it's rat, steamy, dirty hair, and still alive. Caught him last Sunday thinking of the fridge, thinking of you. (laughs) 
I thought that was just simply my weird imagination until I came across an article in the paper two months after that in the Toronto Star which said, some rat droppings in food acceptable in the US. <laughs> and I'll just read a section from it. This is true. <clears throat> the US government yesterday disclosed for the first time the maximum amount of rat droppings, mold, flies, worms, and other contaminants it allows in processed food. The foods in which defects, in quotation marks, can be found in varying degrees include chocolate, vegetables, fruit, eggs, fish, flowers, spices, grains, coffee, nuts, and jam. Examples of the limits include four rodent hairs in 225 grams of chocolate, 100 million bacteria per gram of dried eggs, five rodent pellet fragments, or two pellet fragments and detached rodent hair. <laughs> per 50 grams of cornmeal and one rodent pellet per pint of wheat. In Ottawa, health officials denied that Canada has similar standards. <laughs> it's called Letters and Other Worlds. My father's body was a globe of fear. His body was a town we never knew. He hid that he had been where we were going. His letters were a room he seldom lived in. In them, the logic of his love could grow. My father's body was a town of fear. He was the only witness to its fear dance. He hid where he had been that we might lose him. His letters were a room his body scared. He came to death with his mind drowning. On the last day, he enclosed himself in a room with two bottles of gin, later fell the length of his body so that brain blood moved to new compartments that never knew the wash of fluid, and he died in minutes of a new equilibrium. His early life was a terrifying comedy, and my mother divorced him again and again. He would rush into tunnels magnetized by the white eye of trains, and once, gaining instant fame, managed to stop a parahara in Ceylon. The whole procession of elephants <coughs> dances local dignitaries by falling dead drunk onto the street. As a semi-official and semi-white at that, the act was seen as a crucial turning point in the home rule movement and led to Ceylon's independence in 1948. <laughs> My mother had done her share too, her driving so bad she was stoned by villagers whenever her car was recognized. <laughs> For 14 years of marriage, each of them claimed he or she was the injured party. Once on the Colombo docks, saying goodbye to a recently married couple, my father, jealous at my mother's articulate emotion, dove into the waters of the harbor and swam after the ship, waving farewell. <laughs> my mother, pretending no affiliation, mingled with the crowd back to the hotel. <laughs> Once again, he made the papers, though this time my mother, with a note to the editor, corrected the report, saying he was drunk rather than brokenhearted at the parting of friends. <laughs> the married couple received both editions of the Salon Times when their ship reached Aden. And then, in his last years, he was the silent drinker, the man who once a week disappeared into his room with bottles and stayed there until he was drunk and until he was sober. Their speeches, head dreams, apologies, the gentle letters were composed. With the clarity of architects, he would write of the row of blue flowers his new wife had planted, the plans for electricity in the house, how my half-sister fell near a snake and it had awakened and not touched her, letters in a clear hand of the most complete empathy his heart widening and widening and widening to all manner of change in his children and friends, while he himself edged into the terrible, acute hatred of his own privacy, till he balanced and fell the length of his body, the, the blood screaming in the empty reservoir of bones, the blood searching in his head without metaphor. And finally, a poem called White Dwarfs. 
which is about a certain kind of person um, or artist. This is for people who disappear, for those who descend into the code and make their room a fridge for Superman, who exhaust costume and bones that could perform flight, who shave their morals so raw they can tear themselves through the eye of a needle. This is for those people that hover and hover and die in the ether peripheries. There is my fear of no words, of falling without words over and over, of mouthing the silence. Why do I love most among my heroes those that, who sail to that perfect edge where there is no social fuel, release of sandbags to understand their altitude, that silence of the third cross, third man hung so high and lonely, we don't hear him say, say his pain, say his unbrotherhood. What has he to do with the smell of ladies? Can they eat off his skeleton of pain? The Gurkhas in Malaya cut the tongues of mules so they were silent beasts of burden in enemy territories. After such cruelty, what could they speak of anyway? And Dashiell Hammett, in success, suffered conversation and moved to the perfect white between the words. This white that can grow is fridge, bed is an egg, most beautiful when unbroken, where what we cannot see is growing in all the colors we cannot see. There are those burned out stars who implode into silence after parading in the sky. After such choreography, what would they wish to speak of anyway? I am inscribing these verses on the back of a long proposal to get up a master's program in the study of others' crime at the place where I make my living. I being on the committee that decreed, oh sure, go ahead, teach all the criminology you want. And the way I got on that committee was being too anal retentive to absent myself from meetings of things I was on already. <laughs> so that all the deans declared, here's a boy likes to go meetings, wants to be on things, so we'll put him on more things so he can go to more meetings while the rest of the boys get on with the work. This is known in the teacher's trade as a talent for administration and gets you lots of paper to write poems on the back of. <laughs> but, but after all those meetings, the poems are no good. <laughs> and finally, um, by special request of at least, at most, one person. <laughs> it's a poem called Wasp Winter, written in homage to Wilfred Campbell. Along the line of smoggy streets, the crimson neon glows. And all day long, the DJ bleats from teenage radios. With Nixon's news, the papers groan through all their dreary spread. And all the stoplights in the town have turned their green to red. Now, each with wrinkled, chalky cheeks and vicious, withered mouth, throughout the long, cold winter weeks, rich birds are flying south. 